The wind was still, and the rain trickled straight down in large, slow droplets. Everything smelled of wet soil and grass. She awoke slowly, her first view the cloudy gray sky. When she moved her fingers, she soon realized they were under the dirt. It was grainy, and she could feel things moving throughout the earth. She wriggled her toes and found herself missing one shoe. Her body sore, her face half covered in mud. She quickly began to panic, screaming into the emptiness. Suddenly, above her face, a stout teenaged girl appeared, leaning over her. Are you all right, dearie? She said. She was in a panic. Everything seemed hazy. Where was she? Who was she? Who was that? Come on, let's get you up. That's right, she said egging her to sit up and standing a foot away. She was able to move herself out of the mud, painfully and sore. Did she have wounds that need to be cleaned? She sat there next to the shallow hole she had crawled out of, her short hair wrapped in knots around her horns, her tail wrapped around her legs. She took in her surroundings. She was in a large, open field, no homes, no buildings, no structures at all in sight. But around her, five girls, including the one who spoke, all of varying races, all in their teenage years. "'You're right, miss, you are. You must be cold!' exclaimed the young girl, who now stood in front of her. She still couldn't respond. She was so confused. She had a headache. She stood up and swayed. The girl went to reach out to help, but hesitated. She decided to stay sitting. She watched the rain fall around her, and slowly the five girls sat in a circle. "'Who am I?' she says." Unlucky, laughed the red-headed girl. The stout one in front of her shushed her friend and pointed at her sleeve. I have a funch that that's your answer. There on the cuff, you must be very loved. She looked down to the cuff of her wet and dirty sleeve and wiped at the mud there to find Baxter, messily embroidered in multicolored thread. She began to cry. But I don't know that name. Moments later, the sounds of hooves in the muck made their way to Baxter's long, pointed ears. She looked up suddenly to see a caravan of all shapes and sizes making its way to the clearing. She sat there and looked at these girls sitting in front of her. One red-haired and fair, one dark-skinned with beautiful dark coils, one with pink skin and small horns, one with purple eyes and beautiful blonde hair, and the stout shorter girl in front of her with brown hair and yellow eyes. The caravan slowly made their way closer and, too stunned to do anything but watch, Baxter saw them start to make camp in multiple areas. Many eyes turned to her and her group, confusion and sadness on their faces. Baxter's ears were ringing, but before she could react, she heard a deep male voice from behind her. A bit of an odd place to be in this sort of weather, don't you think? She turned to see a tall, graceful man with red hair and a tailcoat. She ignored him and finally, with the courage to speak, began talking to the woman in front of her, she soon realized that another man stood behind her, talking amongst themselves. The girls looked upset, but were remarking on how ridiculous their outfits looked, loudly, tailcoats, top hats, and each with a cane with matching blue crystals at the heads. Baxter tried to tell them to be kind to strangers, but giggled along with them. She was in a haze, confused, none of this made sense, but sitting with the girls felt normal. Suddenly, the red head opened her eyes wide and yelled, Look out! Before she knew it, she was out cold again. Three years later, there was very little Baxter truly knew of that day, of those girls, and of the outside world. What she did know is that this was the Bernellis and Zinfiel Circus, also known as the B&Z. Volwin and Ferran were well-respected high elves, loved by many handsome, regal, they brought laughter to the faces of so many in these trying times in Faerun, and those faces brought gold to their pockets. That fateful day when they stumbled upon Baxter, a beautiful tiefling girl who could seemingly speak to the other side, they knew she was a gold mine. They locked her in chains during the day and brought in many fortune tellers and oracles to teach her the ways of deception and insight to use her eyes to learn aspects of people, to notice little tells in a person, to know exactly what they wanted to hear. She was taught in the ways of simple and helpful magic. They grew out her hair to a beautiful length and dressed her in a beautiful outfit, which chimed as she walked. The day she was trusted to work as the circus fortune teller with her guard, Sir Malik, stationed with her at all times, 
They soon realized that the people of Faerun did not want a devil telling them their fortunes. It'll only bring bad omens, they'd say. That night, instead of tossing all the hard work they put into their new exhibit, they brought in a local healer to remove her horns and tail and filed her canines down to a regular elven length. This is a drow, they decided. You are a drow, they drilled into her. Your name is Alara, and you love it here at the circus. And each day, she would continue her lessons. During the night, she was brought out as the Oracle of B and Z and soon became known as the Beauty of the Circus. And during the quiet hours of the morning, when everyone was asleep, she taught herself the art of card throwing, being able to slice and nick the skin. But she was a Lara. She was a drow. She loves it here. There was nowhere else to go. After a few years, chained each night, scars surrounding her wrists and ankles, she began to get more privileges. She was allowed to visit other exhibits, and soon made friends with Brary, the halfling acrobat. Brary had been there for 13 years and was allowed all privileges. She was a beautiful blonde halfling full of wonder and sass. She admired her. Each night, before she was put in her nightly lock and key, Brary and her would play cards and talk about all the interesting things they saw that day. Brary taught her new things, such as flirting. This was very odd to her, and she didn't understand anything of the sort, but Brary said that you could get a man to do anything with the right words and perfectly timed eyelash batting. Soon, she was doing even better at her work in the circus. She'd become a star. Everyone would flock to Alara, the oracle, the beauty of the circus to hear from their deceased loved ones, or learn if their marriages will fail, or who they should bet on next. Two years later, a total of five years being hidden, beaten, and then paraded to the public at Brunellis and Zinfiel Circus, she was exhausted and horribly sad. Don't fret, we have it good here. We are fed and have a tent over our heads, Brary would say. But she knew, she knew Brary was kept in similar conditions to her, but she always stayed happy. Besides, where else would she go? She didn't even know who she was. On a sunny day, during one of her lessons from her fully stationed tutor, Miss Nyla, Brary asked if she could have a moment with her. Miss Nyla always had a soft spot for her, even bought her her first set of tarot cards. Of course she allowed it. I'm pregnant, Brary squealed. She was confused. A baby? How? Don't you have to be married to do that? She couldn't remember. How does that work? Nonetheless, she was elated. A baby at the circus. How exciting. The father is Garnin. You know that one halfling clown? Oh, he's just so romantic. We're going to pay out our dues in about two months. This is just perfect timing. Dues. What Valwyn and Varan say we owe for all the classes, clothing, and food they had purchased for us. That is wonderful, she exclaimed. Promise you'll come by tonight, right after close. I'll see you then. I've got to go tell Valwyn straight away so we can start getting prepared. Ah, oh, a baby. Barry left, joy on her small cherub face. Later, after a night talking to the spirits, or faking it when necessary, she ran to Barry's tent. I'm sorry I'm late. The last one couldn't stop wailing. It was ridiculous. Barry? She wasn't in her tent. She looked all over the circus, but could not find her anywhere. So she searched for Garnin. The halfling would not even look her in the eyes. There's nothing I could have done. Look at me. Her heart dropped. She ran to Valwyn's tent. Where is Brary? She said sweetly. She couldn't risk being beaten. Not tonight. She had to know. She's gone. That exhibit became compromised. She looked him right in the eye and she knew. Three nights later, after a successful night at the B&Z, she packed her small satchel with her tarot, her one slipper, and the common shirt with the embroidery. All she owned. All that was hers. Lastly, she tucked a small bejeweled dagger into her belt. Garnon had given it to her the day before, when she said she couldn't do this anymore. She knew he assumed she meant herself and her own life. She left the tent with a fake smile plastered on her pretty face. Sir Malik had been called as extra security, as one of the circus elephants had gotten out of its pen and was angry. She had been given permission to get her daily walk-in on her own. She made her way to Valwyn and Ferran's tent, the biggest one at the end of the circus field, right on the outskirts. She knew Ferran was dealing with the animal exhibits at this time of night. 
they had to be calmed after their horrible treatments during circus hours, and the rogue elephant was bound to still be stomping around. She quietly approached the tent. Mr. Bernellis, I'm sorry to bother you so late. Valwyn saw her, and her big doe eyes and beautiful face. She had put extra sparkles on her eyes and added a purple to her lips. He let her in. How can I help you, Alara? he said. I was wondering if you have any information for me, so I might be better at my work, she said, looking him in the eye innocently. She knew that it was Valwyn who kept a list of her failures, and he often read them to her while she had her beatings, to be better ingrained in her mind. After a soft smile, he said, Of course, my dear, you know I only want you to do your best, and turned toward his desk for his notes. At that moment, she knew she should strike. She grabbed the dagger that was intended for her. She sliced out at Valwyn's throat, and the moment he went to reach for the wound, she used her mage hand to keep the tent flaps closed enough so no one would see the fallen body. She didn't have time to check if he was dead before she grabbed his oversized cloak, cut a hole in the back of the tent, and ran. She ran and ran, spirits telling her left, right, forward, keep going, eventually finding safety just inside the city limits. She sat in an alleyway, cold and shivering, so hard her gold accents on her clothing jingled quietly in the chill night air. It sounded like magic. <laughs> she heard laughter, and two women approached her, one short and wearing commoner's clothes, the other wrapped in a deep purple cloak. Her voice was soothing as she said, Miss, Miss, are you all right? She helped her up and pulled back her hood. She was a beautiful purple drow woman, absolutely stunning. She pulled her into whatever building she seemed to have been sitting against, and it was a dazzling, lavish interior filled with pillows, women, and the smell of strawberries. She brought her to a private room, along with the other shorter woman. "'You must be so cold,' she said, wrapping her in a blanket. She was reminded of the yellow-eyed girl from that day in the rain, long ago. This woman seemed kind and explained that this was a high-end brothel. She asked if she was brought here by someone." She continued to stay quiet and tucked her bloody hands into her coat, but the woman quickly realized and asked the other woman to grab some water and soap. She was cleaned off with a full bath. The woman did not miss the scars on her wrists and ankles, nor the mysterious one centimeter diameter scar on the back of her neck. She looked to the shorter woman, who nodded in response. I'm in need of a new lady's maid. Tara here is having a baby in four months time and will no longer be able to work for me. Would you like a job? It will be discreet. While staring straight ahead, tears began to well up in her eyes. Yes, she said. My name is Moira Tuli, the beautiful woman said to her. What shall I call you? Turning her head to look her directly in the eyes, she said. Baxter. You can call me Baxter. Baxter.